Good evening, everyone. I'm Bernard Schwartz. I'm the director of the 92nd Streetwise Unterberg Poetry Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event, Just Us, a conversation between Claudia Rankin and Robin D'Angelo. The conversation will last about an hour and feature uh, short readings and uh, also a short film. Before we begin, I wanted to announce a few upcoming events or remind you of those. On September 24th, we'll have Zadie Smith in conversation with Ashley Ford. On September 30th, Billy Collins will read from his new collection of poetry. On October 5th, Sarah Broom will be in discussion with Saidia Hartman. And lastly, uh, this Thursday, we'll do a literary seminar on James Baldwin featuring Eddie Glaude. I hope that you can join us for any and all of those. Uh, thank you for joining us. And now I'd like to welcome Claudia and Robin. Enjoy the show. Hello, Claudia. Hi, Robin. What a pleasure for me. <laughs> thank you so much. It's also a great pleasure for me. Uh, I'm coming to you from Seattle, Washington, where it's a little smoky out there. Where are you? In New Haven, Connecticut. Okay, great. It is not smoky here. <laughs> um, I sincerely loved this book. Um, found it very uh, evocative, very emotionally powerful. Um, and, and I think the structure has a lot to do with how effective that was. Can you talk about how you structured it? So maybe well, a little different. Um, the, the initial um, catalyst for the book was the essay, Talking to Men on Airplanes. And because that was written originally for the New York Times, it had to go through fact checking and a few other steps. And I thought, why not ritualize that process for each essay? Mm -hmm. So I hired a um, psychiatrist for this project. And when I had a conversation that seemed to, to, to refuse to leave me, it just kept <laughs> replaying itself, I would write it down and I brought it to the psychiatrist and I said, you know, can we read through this and try to um, understand what my fantasies were towards my interlocutor and perhaps what their fantasies were towards me um, in terms of thinking about race. And, and why would I have said this thing at that moment? And perhaps why did they reply in, in, the, in the way that they did? Once I um, had that conversation with the therapist, I, the psychiatrist, I then um, folded that information into the essay and from there, it went to a fact checker and the fact checker and I went through all of the points to see what technically was true, what, what facts I was actually relying on to uh, make the statements that I made. And, and because I, I didn't want to um, put those facts into the conversation because they weren't exactly what I said, I needed to come up with a structure that could hold the facts and hold the essay equally. So that's how I came up with the verso recto structure where the essay runs on the verso side and on the recto side. Once I had that, then I took the essay and I sent it to the person who I had the conversation with. And I said to them, is this a conversation we had? Is it okay that I publish it? And do you want to respond? I would love if you responded. And, and so sometimes people, no one ever said to me, this is not the conversation we had. But people did say, it's a conversation we had, but I don't think I meant what you think I meant. And in, in some of those cases, they wrote a response. And, um, and then the response was added to the essay. On occasion, I would respond to the response. So that's how the structure got built. And then I also associate it to images and poems and other stuff that got added in. 
Yeah, I mean, tactilely and visually, it's really beautiful. The the glossy pages, there's a lot of imagery. I'm a very visual learner. I find imagery powerful. Um, by separating out the fact checking, you, you're being educated, if you will, but the but through stories that are very evocative and very personal. Um, and I, I had a couple of thoughts as you were speaking, and I was wondering if your psychiatrist was white? She's a white woman who had done a lot of work in um, feminist theory, when I, you know, I live in New Haven, so I um, approached people I knew here and said, "This, you know, this is the project I have. Who would you recommend?" Mm -hmm. And I, at that time, I wasn't asking for a white person or a person of color or a man or a woman. I just said, "Who do you think would be the best person who might be game for this thing?" Because it wasn't really the standard um, issue therapy session and um, and she was recommended highly so mm -hmm. yeah I, I there was a point where I was reading her response to you and I was thinking oh she's white <laughs> I, I'm just I just want to share that uh, just to be really clear for all the audience I'm white um, and I think I do think it is important to draw people's attention to that, you know, uh, whether they're consciously thinking about it or not. This is an, a cross racial conversation that we're having and that every response I'm having, I'm having as a white person. Right? I'm not just having a person response, if you will. Um, and a, a couple of other thoughts was one. Um, how much, for, from my perspective, it, would, it takes a lot of courage to have sent all those essays to the white people involved for their response. Uh, what do you think about that? That, that for me, that would, that would take a lot of courage. Well, um, it, it didn't, I didn't feel it as courage. Mm -hmm. um, I felt it as you know, these are all people who are friends of mine. Mm -hmm. With a, the exception of the guy I met on the plane, who I didn't know very well, um, I had a long standing relation with most of the people who are referenced. So it, it didn't feel like courage, it was more an extension of the conversation. Mm -hmm. It's like we had this conversation, I wrote it down. Do you want to respond? Is it okay if I use it? You know, all of those questions would have had to have been negotiated anyway, um, just for transparency's sake. So it didn't feel correct. What felt um, the emotional place for me was in the interaction itself, in the in in, in the encounters. Mm -hmm. Once the the material moved into the writing and into the space of creation, that to me was a different. That's just the making of the thing. Yeah, I mean, and the reason it lands on me, I mean, I'm noticing um, the, how much of, of the racial, the psychic burden of race you carry that white people don't carry, mm -hmm. right? And so it may not feel like courage to you to, to keep the conversation going, but for most white people, we do not talk about these things. Uh, we don't follow up, uh, we withdraw and avoid. And so what you risk in engaging us is uh, defensiveness, minimization, denial, right? That, that is always there when you're offering the way that you experience something um, with a white person, right? But I think, I think those responses happened inside the encounters. And in, in many of the cases, you know, um, friends would be like, no, I have nothing more to say on this or um, thanks for showing me. And, you know, I was like, oh, you have a lot to say about a lot of things. So interesting. <laughs> right. Interesting. Well, I mean, it's revealing, right? I mean, that's the other thing. And it's like, do I want to see what this reveals, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I had a thought with when you showed those pieces to, to, the, to the white people involved, um, and they may have thought you misunderstood what they meant. And what I would say is, what if... What if you understood perfectly what they meant, but what they don't understand is how what they meant came from a racist framework? I think that's um, really hard for white people to hold because we really do think that so much of our experience is outside of a racial framework. So we don't see race as informing in any way. We don't 
we don't get that we're perceiving through a racial lens. I mean, I I wouldn't have been able to tell you, you know, what it meant to be white for most of my life. So that that came up for me too, like uh, feeling misunderstood across race by a, uh, as a white person does not mean I was misunderstood. <laughs> it might mean that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. But I I, I personally um, think I also don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I um, which is not to say I don't believe what you're saying is true. What you're saying is, is definitely true. But I also don't think I would stay in the conversations if I didn't feel like there were things that I needed to learn, that I wanted to understand more. I mean, for example, with the, the, the white man on plane, I, you know, I kept coming up against a wall with the use of the term white privilege. And it took me a little while to understand that if I wanted to have a different conversation, I needed to say, I'm not talking about economic privilege. And, you know, so that step, sidestep, didn't happen until the conversation kept going to, I've worked hard for what I have. I've worked hard for what I have. I've worked hard for what I had. And then finally I was like, I'm not talking about you working hard for what you had. I worked hard for what I had. I'm talking about your ability to live and negotiate spaces that I cannot enter without surveillance. That's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But it took, it took a little while before <laughs> I understood that I was, you know, we were in this kind of fisticuff around that phrase. And that's why I like your white dominance or um, my my sense of that is more like white living. I mean, it's just like how you get to live your life versus how I, I have to live mine. Yeah, I, I find that I have to say, um, I'm not saying white people don't suffer, struggle or face barriers, but we don't face that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and not facing that one absolutely um, impacts the way we navigate the struggles that we do face, that there's that other layer um, that isn't also being dealt with or addressed, right? You, you give any struggle uh, or barrier a white person faces, and then you add race to that, racialization to that. You know, I, I think most white people hopefully can admit it's going to get harder. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and I, I often think about one aspect of power as a white person is the absence of struggle in a key area of life that other people are struggling in. And so an absence of struggle means you don't feel anything. And I think that white people expect that they, you know, if you say white privilege, they're, that they're gonna feel puffed up and they don't relate to that, right? They don't mm -hmm. feel puffed up. Well, it's the absence of struggle. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's like swimming in a current. You're moving right, your yeah. arms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's but you also yeah, have that current. Um, you, you're, you're, your dissertation was on whiteness, right? The yes. One, yeah, that's what I thought. Um, one thing that there's a, there's a thread throughout the whole book um, that strikes me anyway, um, and that is your recognition that there's no inherent sense of loss for white people. I mean, that's the way the way that I articulate that. Um, you know, as someone who's engaged in this work. Uh, in the beginning anyway, it's hard to relate to concepts like white supremacy and white superiority. I mean, it's not any more difficult for me, but in the beginning, those are such charged terms and we think about them as just people in white hoods. But where I really got it at a gut level um, is that as a white person, I could go cradle to grave uh, living a segregated life, right? With few, if, uh, if any authentic relationships with black people and no one ever conveyed to me that I'd lost anything of value. Exactly. That is such a deep message of white supremacy. It's not going to be the, the N word for somebody like mm -hmm. me for a well-meaning white progressive. Um, in yeah. fact, that we measured the value, the more valuable my neighborhood school career is, the whiter it will be. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it was you who said, or you repeating someone else who said that if a thing is involves diversity or is diversified, it suddenly could be perceived as broken. So mm -hmm. if, if black people come into the neighborhood, the value of the houses go down. If the school 
has um, black children in it, then the school might be a problem. So mm -hmm. that idea that the segregated thing is the good thing and right. the, the um, cross racial thing is a problem. Yeah, I mean, it's a tragedy in the in um, February when we celebrate Black, Black History Month and we talk about the enforced segregation on Blacks in the Jim Crow South, then it's a tragedy. But every day white people live in chosen segregation, segregation yeah. Yeah, that yeah. we have set up uh, and talk about it in glowing terms. Mm -hmm. right? that, that, that's one way in, I think. Yeah. Um, on page 17, you ask a question that I, I, I'm always thinking, you know, about what would be important for white listeners to hear. And you ask a question, why do people think abolitionists cannot be racist? Um, and it reminded me of how often white people have said to me, I marched in the 60s, um, therefore I'm not racist. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that question you raised. Well, I, I raised it partly because it's one that's often raised in the classroom um, by my white female students. Mm -hmm. you know, they'll say to me, why are you giving us such depressing information um, rather than looking what, at the good stuff white people do? Like the abolitionists, for example. And, you know, and then you, know, you pull out somebody like Walt Whitman, who was an abolitionist, but who, who wanted black people to leave this country. You know, there's a big difference between not believing in slavery as a transactional um, mechanism, you turning people into property and, and being anti-black, you know, <laughs> like those are two separate things. And mm -hmm. people seem to think that the one, the one um, erases the other. So that for me was a point that I wanted to underline. I think I have found that that's the hardest thing for, for well-meaning, white people who identify as progressive, likely the kind, the type that would be listening to us right now, um, is this idea of proximity uh, means an absence of racism. So, mm -hmm. so when racism comes up, it's very common for white people to offer up their evidence that they are free of racism will be some form of proximity. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. I work on a diverse team. I taught in a diverse school. I had a black roommate in college. I'm I'm married to a person of color uh, and therefore uh, I cannot be racist, exactly. um, which is uh, check me if I'm wrong here, but not particularly convincing, <laughs> I think, to black folks. Um, but I think so if you don't if you if you don't understand how the structures that make America what it is mm -hmm. are inherently supremacist, then that's already a problem. You know, mm -hmm. if you believe that you can step outside of that. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's always a key component to me in understanding how much the person I'm speaking with understands. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and your book, White Fragility, one of the things I love about it is it, it sort of um, positions white people at the place where they think they can back up and back away from racism rather than really just take it on as something that has created the blueprint for the country from the get-go. It's an inevitable result of being raised in a racist society. Exactly. Right? Um, I, I love the way Ibram Kindi puts it. Uh, we may not be the producers of racist ideology, but we have all been the consumers. But I, I also think we are the producers. I mean, mm -hmm. I, think, I think that the transactional um, mechanisms of slavery, we didn't produce that just generationally, but who produced all of the texts? Mm -hmm. along the way that ended up supporting the ideas that that put in place. Mm -hmm. Those are people, you know, I, I just read this um, essay on um, a painting where I'm not going to go into detail, but it's Olympia, the painting of the white woman on the, the sofa and the black woman behind it. And the, the guy who is known for talking, the, the professor who's known for talking about that painting spent like two sentences on the black woman in the painting, this canonical painting. 
-hmm. So all along the way, the reason it has been able to sustain itself mm -hmm. is because it has been supported, we have been in collusion with it, and the, the mechanisms of it have been replicated, you know. And you know, as Donald Trump says, I'm a nationalist. He's willing to say it, but, <laughs> but they're all, Reagan, everyone else has, has been, you know, who put in place the um, mass incarceration? Mm -hmm. That's just another form of a kind of Jim Crowism or a kind of um, enslavement of people based on their skin color. So I, I would say I don't necessarily agree with this. We have just inherited it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, again, as long as we um, see it as explicit, we are not going to understand it. Right. right. As long as we see it as, as limited to individuals who consciously and intentionally in, you know, want to hurt people based on race, uh, we're going to exempt ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that definition has not changed our outcomes. I mean, they have. I mean, look where we are. Right. And I think a definition like that allows white people to feel like, OK, I didn't do it, but mm -hmm. OK. I'm like, no, you are doing it. Mm -hmm. You are mm -hmm. doing it. Mm -hmm. Who's on those juries? Mm -hmm. Who's on the grand jury that let the police return to the streets each time and and kill black people, unarmed black people, shoot them seven times in the back and then return to the streets? Look how many times Chauvin was called up and then returned to the general population. These are DAs. These are, you know, so I, I, I beg to differ on that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Um, and even if you do not relate to, I see it as a continuum. I might not relate to a police officer who would do that, uh, but my desire for a safe neighborhood with good equity and good schools with testing and tracking to make sure my child has the best of everything uh, relies in large part on the kind of uh, policing and monitoring that, that up until recently happened over there. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it. I didn't have to know about it. Keep it over there. Do what you do as long as my space can be safe. Exactly. Video has made that very difficult. And of course, when you tell me that it's happening, I'll tell you it couldn't be because mm -hmm. it's not happening to me. But video has kind of broken at least a layer of that denial. Right? Well, it's done two things. I think social media has allowed, the social media platforms have allowed people to determine what becomes news. And so up until now, the news um, was being determined, what, what we should be concerned with was being determined by, I don't, you know, I'm not gonna say white people, but- It, it was, <laughs> I've, I've got the data. <laughs> you know, and, and I think these, the telephone, you know, should probably get the Nobel Peace Prize because it's only because we are now able to upload what we're seeing in front of us, that news has, has been able to, you know, has been forced to put it as major news. Up and before that, people, these things were happening. They didn't start happening now. No. You know? And so I think, I think that has been the biggest change. Technology, um, you know, it, there is a, a speech that Martin Luther King gave, and he said that activism has to meet technology. And I feel like we are at that moment now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see. I had um, on page 133, mm -hmm. um, you say that you're hurt when your white friends cannot see that incarcerated and murdered black people are an acceptable loss. Um, and say, perhaps this is my non-white fragility. Uh, and the thought I had there was that while white fragility is in part a refusal for white people to allow the pain in, perhaps non-white fragility is, is an inability to fully keep the pain out. Mm -hmm. I just want to be really clear that those function very differently. Yeah. Um, and, and when I talk about white fragility related to white people, I'm talking about essentially the sociology of dominance, how white people maintain their positions by making them so miserable to question. <laughs> um, and so I just wanted to pull that out and um, see what you thought. 
Well, um, I mean, I think that's a good distinction and I, I didn't mean it exactly as a re reversal, obviously. Yeah. But, and, um, but I do think, I do think that one of the things I try to show in Just Us is there are times when I get stalled in conversations because I am emotionally overwhelmed might be a word or disappointed might be another word or um, exhausted might be another word with the, the repetition of the inability of white people to arrive in the reality I feel like I'm living. And um, and I, you know, maybe <laughs> if I'd had your training, I would uh, I would be able to kind of um, ride those moments a little better. But I do find that sometimes I'm I'm I I'm inside a conversation, and I I do feel a kind of um, feeling of. I, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. I can't believe you, you are saying this to me. You, this person I've known for so long. You, who I thought I un I understood mm -hmm. and I thought we were in the same state. So, and then I get, you know, and then I get the same range of emotions <laughs> that are, that's on your list. I, I become mm -hmm. silent. I become, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, whatever I become. Well, um, <laughs> I do believe that that black people and other people of color understand the dynamics I write about to a degree that I never will. You know, they've been uh, you've had to navigate them your whole life. You've had to on some level recognize them and deal with them. Um, but as an but it's, not, but it's not that I don't think I I recognize and deal with them. But I mean, your ability to and this is where I think white fragility has been a gift to the culture. Your ability to name and categorize those emotions and those reactions, I think is different from what happens in conversations. I think if we were able, if I and my interlocutor were able to say, oh, this is what we're doing, um, we could then navigate it quicker and understand her own emotional feelings in, you know, at rapid speed which I'm assuming what is what happens in workshops. You're able to see people doing something and then um, name it and, and maybe not, but that, that's no, why I'm family. laughing because it doesn't mean that they're, they're receptive to, to uh, being it themselves. <laughs> but, but that's my fantasy of what goes on in those. Um, yeah, well, um, I, what I want to say is that as an insider, I do have a take on it that you don't take, that you don't have, right? And that's why I think we all need to kind of bring our pieces to the table. But mm -hmm. the training in sociology has given me a question that's never failed me. And that is, how does it function? And I think this is what we're teasing out here is what you might call it uh, for your fragility, non-white fragility. And um, I call it white fragility when it's coming from me, the function, the impact of it is very different. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's what we have to acknowledge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So on that note, um, Yes. We're at the midway point, so we can do two things. We can read a piece from the book that we talked about. We could see the video. What what would be good? Um, why don't we show the video? I think it okay. might be because that would lead into some other. Okay, great. Let's see. Uh, tech Q. Yes. <laughs> There is an African American man I am in such a heart. He is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. Amy Cooper calls the police on a black man bird watching. Hers was a quotidian reminder, reminder of the normalcy of how can I put it? Having not been men.
to survive. Christian Cooper, no apparent relation, asked Amy Cooper to put her dog on a leash. It was a simple ask in accordance with the rules of Central Park's ramble. I am enthralled with Cooper's affect, her plaintive 911 call of distress, I'm gonna tell them there's an African -American man intensified my with each repetition of the phrase, I am being threatened. And there is a man, African American. I am being threatened. He is recording me and threatening By the me third repetition, her voice there is quivers. An man. I am in but she is able to multitask and reattach the leash to the dog as she speaks. Like an actor heightening her fear in her performance of a line, she pushes on. I am being threatened. Cooper and I both recognize she can bet on racism, racial profiling, and possible unwarranted murder of a black person to be supported systemically by random policemen, prosecutors, judges, and the carceral system at large. Our mutual socialization into repeated patterns of discrimination allows her to do what she does and prepares me to understand what she is doing in the daylight of what I am seeing. Where we part company, where we part, where I am no longer a part, is in her expectation that I will agree that she is afraid. Do fantasies create real emotions? Is Christian Cooper's possible death an acceptable loss? History says, yes. Yesterday said, yes. If fantasies are relevant to the moment, are they not also relevant to the consequences of the moment. Can I categorize Amy Cooper's behavior as an American story that plays fast and loose with notions of imagined fear? To imagine herself as a rescue, to imagine herself into a rescue narrative is to activate a covert white female power trigger that can easily call in the violence of white men. One white friend puts it this way. Amy Cooper assumed her role as a piece of high value white property in jeopardy, tapping into what she knows to be a salient catalyst for swift and deadly intervention. Given this, is her performance more incredulous rage than fear? The rules, the rules don't apply to her. Am I to understand her as thinking or is it feeling the fullness of, don't you see who I am? Is that white living right below, just below, a level of civility, unspoken but believed. Rage tied to white identities assumes sense of ownership of all property. Her park, her city, her apartment building, her, her, her president, her police force. Cooper's exact words were, I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. Hers is the language of good manners, weaponizing the narratives of white racism. Excuse me, she says to Christian Cooper as she dials the police. There are so many Amy Coopers Women like Lucy Foreman Hartley, 
the white woman who served as justification for the Tulsa massacre, the white woman behind the Rosewood massacre, the two white women behind the imprisonment of the Scottsboro boys, Carolyn Bryant Dunnan, who finally admitted to lying, but whose admittance could not bring back to life Emmett Till, or Linda Fierstein, who prosecuted the Central Park jogger case and willfully sent five black and Latinx teenagers to prison for years, for years on false and suppressed evidence. Do I need to go on? The various modes of behavior that white women weaponize in service of black death are there to be metabolized. It's an old script supported by this one. So, um, <laughs> the, um, I, you know, I, I wanted to include the video because it is the conversation that wouldn't have, would have found its way into just us if it had happened four months earlier. But it, that Amy Cooper video with Christian Cooper in Central Park Ramble, to me, is the epitome of liberal um, interactions that assume ownership of space, as, especially with white women and the ability to weaponize their grievances by pulling in the structures of power in order to, um, you know, as she says, I'm gonna tell them an African American man is, is, is um, threatening me. And, and within 24 hours, we saw Chauvin kill George Floyd. So the, there's, there's, no, um, there's no end. To, to these moves that get mm -hmm. made inside these conversations towards recentering whiteness as both ownership in positions of ownership and, and power. Of course, and the, the video ends with the women in protests, um, the, the cross racial groups in protests now in, um, in Portland. Yeah, and I believe Amy Cooper said, I'm not racist, as pretty much every every incident we've ever watched that's been videotaped, the white person will say, I'm not racist. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why I see it as a functionally meaningless claim. Uh, I want to go back to something you said, which is when a white person says something like that, what it's telling you is not what we think it's telling you. <laughs> it's telling you how much we understand or don't understand, mm -hmm. and that perhaps we're not someone who you're gonna be able to engage with. Um, and so if you were having that conversation now in the book, would you be talking specifically about white women or would you use Amy Cooper to break down those pieces? Well, I think um, if, I, if, the, if Amy Cooper found its way in the book, it would find its way through the conversation I've had with white mm -hmm. women and men who say to me, I don't understand why Amy Cooper lost her job. What she did in the park was not good. It was racist, what she said, but it's, it's too much that she should lose her job. And so this idea that she is willing to weaponize the system in order to create a confrontation that could possibly end in Christian Cooper's death is not enough of a narrative to justify the displacement of, of her, why would I want that woman handling any portfolio that I had? Mm -hmm. um, so it makes sense to me that they let her go. But for white people, it's it's too much, it's too much. Yeah, at the, 
at the same time, I, I imagine a lot of white people don't see ourselves in Amy Cooper, right? It's easy to to distance her. Um, and I think we need to see ourselves in Amy Cooper. We need to ask ourselves, you know, who do I become uh, when I feel uh, off my equilibrium? I mean, she's in the park. It's white space, conscious or not. Uh, there, There's a breach there. Uh, it seems like implicit bias moves very quickly to explicit bias. And I think that's important because a lot more people are doing work on implicit bias, and I'm glad for that. Um, but if you don't also talk about st the structural power behind one group's implicit bias, mm -hmm. you're just kind of in a way, uh, I think, reinforcing a, a, a form of racial innocence, right? It doesn't stay implicit very long. <laughs> and I see her the more he remains dignified, the, the, the more he does not defer, the more unraveled she becomes, right? The more hysterical she becomes. That for me is, a, I don't know that you could get a better test, uh, test case example of white fragility. Mm -hmm. Now, if she is transformed by this experience, if she moves through it, if she kind of uh, gets involved in, in different things. It's not that white fragility is a is a end point that can't be overcome, but if you wanna see what people mean when they say white women's tears, my goodness, there it is. And then the thing that was interesting to me about her is that even days after in the interviews, she, she insisted that she was terrified. Mm. Even though he's the one saying, don't come close to me. Mm -hmm. Um, in every situation where I've been terrified, my initial reaction is to leave, to 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 leave quickly and immediately. So I don't know how you stay in a situation and then claim that you are terrified by the situation. Well, so, I, I can say as a woman, <laughs> if I come across, across a man who I'm afraid of in the park, I, I move away, not towards. She actually exactly. moves towards him. him. Yeah, he said, do face. not approach me. Yeah. I mean, partly because of um, COVID, but nonetheless, do not approach me is what he said. Do not come close to me. Yeah. yeah. So it's those kinds of inconsistencies that is really interesting to me that white people can see that, watch that video, and then come back and say, I don't think what she did was that bad. Um, and then you realize you're really talking to and dealing with deep levels of denial around what is possible in this culture. Yeah, and I think a piece of that is, is that uh, we see ourselves as separate from history. I don't, I don't, I wasn't raised to see myself as bringing the history of my group into this conversation, but our histories are between us uh, as we have this conversation. And it, of course it is a history of harm from my group to your group. And so this idea that we're each unique and special individuals separate from that history. And so this looks like an isolated incident, but it is a piece of the fabric of the entire society. Right? Exactly. Yeah. It's happening at all times. This was just an, a moment of being able to see it, but, but the absence of loss, the apathy, um, I, I often ask white people who are asking me now, what do I do? One, how have you managed not to know? Because mm -hmm. I think that's a willful not knowing. The information's everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> and two, yeah, yeah what, did it, what did it take to get you to ask? Yeah. Like how many of those videos did you have to see before you asked? Exactly. Right? What had to cut through that for you? I mean, the, the, um, the person whose research I referenced earlier was Denise Morell. She wrote a book, um, Posing Modernity, and she's the one who did the essay on Manet's Olympia. But that, that, to me, is always a great example because it's just like how many art historians, white male art historians, have taught that painting without looking at the Black woman in the painting and until she pointed out that the canonical essay on the painting doesn't mention the black woman except for two sentences. People, no other white historian has brought it to task before now. And why is that? You know, that's just bad scholarship. Mm -hmm. And of course, if it was a white uh, man behind her, I mean, it's not as if, oh, we don't mention this exactly. other person in the, in the exactly. picture. Exactly. And I exactly. think, 
I think, and I'm going to put air quotes around subtleties. These are subtleties to white people, right? Um, but that reinforces white supremacy, white superiority. Yeah. Um, and white supremacy is just a highly descriptive word, uh, a term for a culture in which white people are the norm for humanity, the standard by which every other mm -hmm. uh, kind of person is is measured. And so when we're in that class listening to this scholar discuss this painting, we're all also being reinforced um, in the invisibility of that woman, right? Exactly. In, in the non-importance of her presence. And you know, one question I often have is how how much is the term Republican a, a, a kind of term for white supremacy? Hmm. Because if you have a group of people whose agenda is um, a kind of separatist, um, nationalistic uh, um, desire to keep people out of this country um, and to own the country as theirs, why, why are we calling that political party, why don't we call that political party what it is? And why have we settled with this other phrase that shields us mm -hmm. from actually seeing? I mean, one of the things that Donald Trump has gifted this country is the outright language of mm -hmm. rights, supremacy, and nationalism, the, the refusal to name um, white nationalist groups and white supremacist groups as terrorist groups. You know, the, the, the good people on all sides um, comments that he's made in the past. So I think, I think we, we need to think about what these people are voting for. And 62% of white men voted for Donald Trump despite his overt agenda and 47% of white women. 40, you know, even if you're going to say the election was stolen, 47% to 45%, why did Hillary Clinton not get an overwhelming support from white women to the point where it would have been impossible to steal the election? You know, Donald Trump lately has been um, sending tweets out to suburban um, white people saying, um, he is preventing low income housing to invade their neighborhoods and that Cory Booker is gonna be put in charge of this by Biden. And what he's depending on is the racism of white women. Mm -hmm. He can depend on the support of white men because he got that 62%, but he knows that the economics of the time, the, um, um, because of the extremes of the virus, um, that things might not feel comfortable to some of these women. So he's trying to give them um, coded language about invasion of black people into their lives as a way to keep them. And that's his way of saying, I know you all are racist. Um, so, you know, hello. And, and why white people will not just call that out, I, you know, I don't, I don't understand in this late date, why, why the silence around that? Yeah, um, I, and I think that white people who support Donald Trump don't support him in spite of his racism. I actually think they support him because of his racism, because he gives permission to what has always been roiling just under the thinnest layer of uh, politeness, if you will. Okay. Um, and the only reason uh, that I hesitate to to change the, the term Republican for white supremacist or white nationalism, and it's clear that, that it is aligned with that, is because the moment I do that, I allow myself to put the racist over there, and well, then okay. I'm not racist and we're not racist. Right. And so okay. I often, go ahead. But isn't it, it's not so much that they're not racist, but that they're overt, commitment is to the continuation of this agenda, which is a little different, I think, from, from 
understanding your races, but having an unwillingness to change because you don't want to give stuff up. But but to say that I'm a white nationalist, that's a different. Uh, yes. And I, I just visualize a continuum in my mind, but that can't be there without this end of the continuum, yeah, yeah. without the passivity and the and the silence. Um, and there's a claim I, I make in white fragility, and I always get asked about it. Love to hear your response to it. And then I say, I think that white progressives, which would be on the other side of this line, um, may cause the most daily harm uh, to black people. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to explain that more, but I'm wondering how that lands on you. Um, I think what I think is, you know, the racism is across the board, but I do think that you have to tie that racism to the structures of power, in power. So, who prevented the impeachment from going forward? Mm -hmm. You know, Mitch McConnell and the other senators who, who said, no, we are not impeaching this person who, um, who has put us in the dire situation we are in right now unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. I think I think that that's different to me than white. But then, you know, I, I maybe also Clinton, you know, the more you look at the, the kinds of policies that Clinton put in place, it, they're not that different. Not, I'm not talking about Hillary, but, but Bill. But so, yeah, I guess we can't, we can't parse it up. It's all, you're responsible for everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's important for each and every white person in a society that we're in to yeah. ask themselves, not if they are part of the problem, not if they've internalized oh. racist ideologies, but how. And yeah. the, I grew up in poverty as a white person. I learned my place in the racial hierarchy from a different class position than I would have had I been middle or upper class but I still learned it uh, and it's on me to unpack. So how did I learn it? How does it intersect with class? And then how does it manifest in my life today? Well, you know, this is, this is what I think about that, that white progressive thing. The, 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 the segment of our society who refused to vote for Hillary or to vote at all, one of the things that I heard many times said to me is it makes no difference. Mm. And I'm, I'm, I'm here to say it does make a difference. I'm with you. It made a huge difference, a huge difference, a, a, a monumental difference. And um, so, you know, and if people feel like they're going to replicate that again with the Trump versus um, Biden and Harris, Trump, Pence versus that that is a problem because so that's why I'm a little bit not with you on that statement exactly because I think the difference the way in which that difference impacts my life um it's not one that I can sustain yeah in fact the whole country cannot sustain it which is what we're seeing now yeah. Yeah. I mean, 45 of the 51 federal judges appointed by Trump, exactly. uh, I should say he has appointed 45 of the 51 mm -hmm. who are white and mm -hmm. most are from the Federalist Society, which was considered fringe at one time. It was so extremely conservative. Yeah. So, yes, it matters in in yes, lots of exactly. rippling ways. Yeah. yeah. In the like in who gets positions in a power. I mean, this is why Ruth. Ginsburg has to stay alive. If, if that didn't matter, it wouldn't matter oh, if, she, yes. if that Supreme Court seat was vacated now or later. And yes. we all know that that matters. So that I, I yeah, it's it's a, it's a you know it's a difficult um, negotiation, but one I would rather um, negotiate with the progressives. All right. Well, the, the, a lot of the white people are uh, that you that you tell uh, stories about in the book. I would assume are progressives, uh, but I wanted to shake them as I was reading. <laughs> so, um, 
it's just so given I know my people really well and any way out of this will take. So I hear you. And I just mm -hmm. want to call to every every white person. We all play a part. What that part is, is kind of on us to identify. But is, if we just say, oh, it's over there and not over here, um, that passivity uh, will help that happen over there. Right. Yeah. It, what will resist it if we don't actively resist it? But, you know, the book is about having conversations with white progressives. I don't think I could have written this book with those other people. They, I mean, they won't even share a space with me. Mm. I can start the conversation. We saw that when um, President Obama was president. Mm -hmm. we, the inability for the executive office to even work with the Senate that's, you know, that's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are coming to the top of the hour. Is there anything that you wished I had asked you or that you would love to just speak to in, in the last few minutes? Well, is there anything else you wish to ask me? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, it might take us a little further into the hour, but there, but there is a story about a, um, going to a play with a white friend and the, I'm assuming it's the black filmmaker or actor asks the white people to come onto the stage. Uh -huh. Um, and he frames it as the opportunity to, for the, the people of color in the audience who just experience, uh, not being, uh, the gaze, right? To experience being to be the whole audience. I mean, he he's clear about how he frames that. It's a she. She. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before I kind of respond to to your friend, is there anything you want to add about that? That. Well, story? why don't I read a little tiny three okay. sentences from the book about that? Um, so the scenario is that I'm at the play with my white friend. She, the the actress, says. Um, can the white people go on to the stage and give the people of color the space of the audience just to, to enact something that doesn't happen in real life in, in the moments of the final. And, and my white friend refuses to get up and go on the stage. Um, is my friend's refusal to move, to be seen moving a move she needed to make? Is it a message, a performance of one? Is she telling the black audience you all don't get to look at me. You don't get to see me as a white specimen. This is fucked up. The man behind me had said, the unconscious as I understand it can lose context or perspective. Maybe my friend cannot bear to be told what to do and how that started and where it will end has little to do with her whiteness or everything to do with her whiteness my perception of a blind spot around racial dynamics could lead to a larger discussion of white feminism and white entitlement. Maybe I'm only responding to her whiteness because the play constructed a scene around our unshared racial positioning. Maybe my own line of reasoning is such a stretch that it'll snap back to hit me in the face. Nonetheless, an incoherent sting lingers. I can't let it go. I won't let it go. What do you care? I ask myself. And still I care about the architecture of my intimacy with this woman. From this moment forward, how easily will the pronoun we slip from my lips? Thank you. Um, and so you send to her this, um, well, when you go outside, you, you do mention it. And she says, I didn't want to. Yeah, I say, I, I say to her, um, I didn't know you were black initially, and she doesn't respond to that. And then later I asked her why she didn't get up, and she said, I didn't want to. Um, so, I mean, the entitlement of that, I'm just going to say the entitlement of that for me is really strong, particularly when the white audience has been asked to, in the um, service of just having people who never get to experience being away from the white gaze to have that. And she just didn't want to, right? She um, talks a lot about in, in a reply to you later, I really wanted the play to succeed, <laughs> but well, you didn't support it in doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but what really struck me is she said, um, uh, maybe of interest to you and important to me, 
Um, I, sometimes a, I know I shrink sometimes a lot, sometimes a little from scenes where I'm asked personally or generally to feel bad as a white person, where whatever else is being asked, I'm also being asked to feel shame, guilt, to do penance, to stand corrected, to sit down, chastised. I mean, that she goes there, right? That that she feels as a white person, one, that she's being asked to do that much too often, which I would say, please, uh, on a daily basis, how often are you asked to feel racial shame as a white person? But that that is how, she, I mean, she, she says this as if this is a fact. I am being asked to feel bad as a white person when it's already clearly been framed as as, as a moment of relief for, for the people of color in the audience, not to... Right. And so I think the exposing of herself as white uh, is is what came up for her and not wanting to do that. Um, yes. So, yeah, no, but I, I appreciated her, though, kind of whether or not I agree with her response, I appreciated her on untangling it. And 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 trying to lay it out, but but I agree with you that the whole point of the play was this doesn't happen in real life, <laughs> so you can actually perform something that never happens, mm -hmm. and to say no to that seems deep, deep. Mm -hmm. That seems like a really powerful note to end on. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So you. It's oh, been thank so you so great to be in conversation with you. Yeah, you too. Thank you continue. Yes. An honor. And thanks to the audience. Bye. Bye-bye.